Welcome to the Black Spray Hood podcast. In this interview, we're interviewing John Haskell. We actually first met John back in Cardiff. Uh, John's catamaran was on the berth opposite ours when we first bought our boat. And when we turned up in La Linea, bizarrely, his catamaran was there again. And so um, just before he was due to catch his flight, we grabbed the opportunity to talk to him because we're crossing the Atlantic in a sailing boat. He's done it in a rowing boat, which is a million times harder. If you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast, there's a clip from a song composed by his friend Paul Duggan, which is called One Gentle Moment. to the Black Spray Hood podcast. Today we're interviewing John Haskell, um, who is a firefighter and has also rowed across the Atlantic and is next planning to row across the Indian Ocean for charity. So John, you were a firefighter. Can we ask um, what made you want to become a firefighter? Oh, oof. Well, I was, I was off to join the army, um, but they weren't recruiting for another six months. So I thought, oh, I'll try my luck at uh, the fire service and the police. And I sort of, I went through the process of both and um, I got through to the fire service and then um, I just stuck with it. So, ideally, I was going to join the army for a few years and then come up and join the police and the fire service. But because it came through, I got through quite, through quite easy. I, I just joined and stayed there 29 years. Uh, did, did you have like, any hurrying uh, experiences? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, we, we were on a busy station. It was... Um, there was a lot of fires in Cardiff, uh, South Wales. It's a, it's a big city with lots of suburbs um, and some poorer areas. And yeah, there's it some quite some quite big fires. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's not the big fires. It's the scary ones. It's the smaller house fires with all the dangers in that. You know. Can you tell us any particular experiences that may have affected you? Well, yeah, there, there's there's always the. Um, the bad ones, there was always lots of blood and guts, and there was uh, obviously death and destruction. You know, you see a fire engine going down the street, it's never going to something happy, it's just going to somebody's misfortune. So, uh, there was a lot of death, you know, we've seen a lot of fatalities. Um, I was on a bit, our, our station dealt with car accidents as well. We had all the specialist kit for car accidents, so uh, we dealt with a lot of car accidents. Um, so, you can imagine the, the mess in some of those, you know cutting people out of the smashed up cars. So you said that you, you almost being deployed to like uh, to help him 
Bowen during the 9/11. Yeah, I was on um, a part of my, my my job. I was a volunteer for an overseas rescue team. Uh, we did a lot of training for earthquakes and everything. Uh, and then when 9/11 happened, uh, we realised we never had anything for any, that type of incident in this country. So. Um, they used our AXAT team, which was United Kingdom Fire Service Search and Rescue, uh, and we were um, loaded up, ready to go out to 9-11 to help with the, with the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. um, but that didn't come about because the Americans shut down all the airspace, and our military flight from Bryce Norton uh, wasn't cleared then to, to do a landing in America. So yeah, I didn't get to go, to, thankfully. Mm -hmm. So can I ask, how did your experiences as a firefighter impact your mental health? Um, it, it, it broke me to bits, to be honest. Like I, I had a full meltdown at the end. You know, um, I, I could have left the fire service after 30 years. You, like on the old pension, you do 30 years or work till you're 55, whichever comes first. You can, you can choose to leave. I managed 29 years, um, and in, a, in the last three years of my career, um, I had a few incidents with, with kids, which wasn't nice, and I think that pushed me over the edge then, um, and I couldn't cope anymore. Um, I had a bit of a breakdown and then suffered from PTSD. I uh, had uh, lots of counselling from the fire service. Um, I did lots of mental health well-being stuff. And then um, just, just got well again then, yeah. So what made you decide to like roll across the Atlantic? Well, uh, it was a bit of a midlife crisis really, I think. And I wanted to do something, it was a time in my life, um, you know, I wanted to do something big and chivalrous for charity. So. Um, I had the opportunity, this old wooden boat that nobody rows the Atlantic in anymore, um, was in exhibit in Swansea Museum. Um, and I knew the guy who owned the boat, so I asked him if I could have an end of it to do a row of my own. So with two years of refurbishing the boat, I took it basically back down to a bare wooden shell, refiberglassed all the joints, then all the electronics and the wiring and everything. And then, uh, yeah, I did the row. But literally two years of non-stop planning and charity fundraising and working on the boat, you know. So what were the most memorable parts of that experience? Um, well, I've, I've blocked out all the horrific stuff, like um, the huge septic boils on my bum, <laughs> <laughs> and um, just losing all the skin, wherever your skin touched, just the salt um, turned into crystals and just rubbed, and then you just lost all your skin. Um, so, but I've blocked all the horrific stuff out, but the wildlife was amazing. We swam with whales. Um, we had whales around the boat, pods of thousands of dolphins, the night skies were just amazing. Um, you know, watching shooting stars skipping across and disappearing over the horizon, so that was quite memorable. And, and just the vastness of being in a 20-foot little wooden boat, um, knowing you're a thousand miles away from shore either way. Uh, and just that privilege to be in that vast location, yeah, definitely. And did you come across two other vessels? Yeah, we um, we nearly got run down um, once. I was rowing. Jamie, my rowing partner, was was resting. We we rowed two hours on, two hours off, twenty four hours a day. So Jamie was in the cabin, and a boat came over the horizon and headed straight for us. So we hailed him on the radio and asked him to move to starboard while we rowed. You know, and we just missed him. Literally, we were caught in his wake, but we we were within about fifty meters of being run down. Yeah, that was pretty horrific. And what was most challenging about it? Um, just the monotony, you know, you, 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 we were doing two hours on, two hours off. So you're having six bedtimes and breakfast times a day and just coming out the cabin and seeing the horizon, it was just monotonous. It was, it was just, each day was the same for days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks, just just the same, just that horizon. I, I can't look at the horizon the same now. If I see the horizon, it just it takes me back to just that. That was my only view for weeks and weeks and weeks. Too, yeah. And how did you work as a team? Fantastic. And, and to be honest, we, we didn't spend any time together because you're either rowing or asleep. It was too exhausting to socialise and sit up and have a cup of tea together. Uh, once you finished your rowing, you would just straight in your cabin and off, get to sleep as fast as you can, ready for your next shift in two hours. Yeah. And now you want to double the pain, double the length. And you're going to cross the Indian Ocean. Yeah, well, it's two, it's two years past its sell-by date. Um, because of COVID, we were all ready to go. Um, and so now it's, it's, it's literally imminent that it's coming up next um, sort of March time. 
And I don't know. Now I've forgotten, obviously, all the bad bits. So why would I want to do it again? I don't know. Just to experience the ocean, just in you know that vastness, you just can't explain it. Like you're obviously going to do a crossing soon yourself on a, on a sailboat. So even on a bigger sailboat, you will experience that just that vastness. It's just a, such a privilege to be out there. You know, it's absolute privilege. Okay. What what training do you have to do? Um, well, the good thing is um, you have to put a bit of weight on before you go because you can lose 25% of your body weight. Um, when I went on the last Atlantic row, I lost four stone in weight. Um, so whatever that is in kilos. Um, but yeah, four stone in weight we lost from the rowing because obviously you row in 12 hours a day of hard physical exercise. You're not eating proper food. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's going to be quite arduous in that way as well. Yeah. So, how long does it take for you to get used to trusting your vessel and to use care in the first days? Yeah, well, the, 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 the vessel's had a, out in across the Atlantic, which is good, so it's had a test. Um, uh, that's, that's, so that's had a nice test, really. Um, but, yeah, you just trust it as carbon fibre, the boat, the electronics are second to none. You know, you just you just trust it. It becomes almost not a vessel, but it, it becomes like a, like a like a life capsule. You know, because it, it everything you need is on there. Or you take all your food. You got a water maker. So yeah, you just you just trust your kit and your boat one hundred percent. And you're you're doing it for charity. Can you tell us about the charity you're doing it for? Yeah, well, I'm. Um, there's three of us rowing this this one, and um, Billy is an ex firefighter, and Rachel is a paramedic. So obviously working hand in hand um, with frontline blue light charities um, which, which is just seems a chivalrous thing to do knowing that what I've been through and what Billy's been through and, and what Rachel will go through in her career so yeah we're uh, looking after looking after each other and ourselves you know we hope you enjoyed this episode thank you very much for listening